Well, good morning, and again, happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and mother figures. Um, it's our joy and our honor to celebrate with you this morning. And I know now more than ever, our modern world is really seeing and experiencing the strength of mothers and parents with the unbelievable demands that have arisen. And the things that you're juggling and doing are not going unseen. So I just personally want to thank you for everything that each of you is doing to keep your families afloat during this time. And the word for us today is one that I really pray will be an encouragement to you in whatever season of parenthood you may find yourself in. Whether you're preparing for a future of parenthood, if you're currently in the throes of wearing all the hats as a full-time professional parent working from home, if you've graduated into parenting your young adult children, or perhaps are in a season of parenting your own parents. Even if you've never had or never planned to have children, I believe that there's so much in the Word about God's design for each of us in taking up our roles to prepare the next generation. You can just look at the history of the Israelite nation and how each generation brought the next either closer to or further from God's promises. So it's important for us to remember that the decisions that we're making today are shaping the world for the next generation to come. And whoever you are, whatever your parental status, you matter in that movement of bringing up the next generation. So before we dive in this morning, I just want to take a moment to pray over you and over God's word for us today, because I know that he's got something for each and every person who's listening. So Lord God, we just thank you for the opportunity, God, to gather together as we celebrate motherhood and um, parenthood. And God, I just pray your strength over each of the parents here and the parental figures. Um, God, I pray that you would empower them through your word today, God, that they would hear your voice above mine. Uh, God, that your truth would be revealed in a way that lightens their yoke, Lord. You say that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And so God, I just pray that this morning as we open up your word, they would find that to be true. And God, that this wouldn't be just another thing that's added to the to-do list of expectations, but God, that they would find freedom um, in your word today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bible this morning, our primary text is going to come from a pretty well-known passage in Luke chapter 15. And this is about the prodigal son. And it's not a particularly long passage, but it's a passage that's truly rich in um, in information about parenting. And it can be looked at from so many different angles. So it's my hope that we can walk away with some fresh perspectives that'll help us prioritize what matters, as we've been talking about in our My House series. Um, as I've been thinking a lot through the season that we're that we're currently in as as a nation and uh, throughout the globe, I've been thinking a lot about my different parent friends, and I began to consider so many of the self-doubting, I'm thinking sort of feelings and statements that are out there as everyone's doing their best to manage the circumstances that they're in, and I've noticed that most people are kind of at um, one end or the other of a spectrum. Um, either they are really embracing the season and feeling like this is what they've been hoping for, a time to slow down and to really engage with their families and rest, and that's fantastic. And then there's others who are really just trying their best to do all the things at once and not feeling like maybe they're doing exactly what they had hoped in this season. And as I was thinking and praying over this, the parable of the prodigal son came to mind in a new way that I hadn't really thought about before, um, particularly in light of the parent's story. And I wondered how many people right now are feeling like a prodigal parent? And depending on where you are on that spectrum, you know, that could look like a lot of different things, uh, ranging from totally na nailing it in the parent game and just really seizing the season to feeling like a prodigal yourself, um, feeling like you've longed to be at home, but you're wasting the time because the way things are, frankly, is not what you were wishing for. It's crazy, it's exhausting, it's overwhelming and nearly impossible. But I just wanna remind you that as our parent, God has given us the grace for this season. There's grace for you as the parents that your children need. And one of the beautiful things about children is that God has pre-programmed them with that same grace for us as our parents too. Or as their parents too. <laughs> they're resilient, they're forgiving, 
and you are the parent. You are the biological, legal, or spiritual parent that God has divinely matched with the children of all ages in your care and influence. He's lavished his grace on us in a prodigal sense, um, which is sometimes seen as, as reckless and abundant. And so I wanna take a little bit to really explore that through this story in Luke chapter 15. So we'll be looking at verses 11 through 32. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he'd spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father's killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. And because of this, his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came home, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. In this passage, we're looking at a season of parenting in which the children are um, into that fledgling young adult phase. You've got two sons who are approaching their launch into the real world, and one is especially eager to get going with his own life. And he recognizes that as the younger son, he's entitled to a third of his parents' estate. So he boldly goes to them and asks for his inheritance in advance of their death. Um, while his older brother, who's slated to receive about two thirds of the majority of the inheritance, um, faithfully continues to stay at home and share in the family business. So as you could expect from the boldness of his request, the younger brother, who we know is the prodigal son, goes out into the world and lives it up until all of his money runs out. And he finds himself, as well as the country that he's run off to, in complete financial ruin. He's starving, he's alone, he struggles to find work or to even feed himself. And he comes to this sobering reality of his mistakes and begins to plot his return and repent to his family. So he goes home and all goes well for him because his father has been anticipating his return and he receives him back with more grace and mercy than the son could have ever imagined. Um, and all is well and they celebrate and everything's great until his older brother, who's still hard at work during the start of the party, finds out that his little brother's 
return has come and is furious that while he remained faithful to the family without ever being celebrated, his brother can come home after completely betraying them and is welcomed back um, in spite of his recklessness and irresponsibility. So this provides their father with this prime but challenging opportunity to continue to demonstrate some incredible parenting techniques that um, we're going to dig into in this passage. So some of the hot button words that we're hearing right now um, in the scope and scheme of the the COVID virus are pivot and PPE or uh, personal protective equipment. So as we're learning to pivot in this season and use this time to really redefine our home lives, I want to give you a few pointers for what I call prodigal parenting that come out of this passage. If you can't tell, I really enjoy alliteration, so you'll hear some of that in it. Um, But I want to give you some, some spiritual PPE, if you will. So what does this really mean to be a prodigal parent? Let's take a look. The first thing about a prodigal parent is that they prioritize properly. Um, I like to think of this in kind of a, a similar fashion as the oxygen masks that you might have to use on an airplane, hopefully not. Um, But if you've ever been on an airplane, you know that there are a number of pre-flight instructions that you're given, um, things that you need to be prepared for in the event of an emergency. And one of those is if there's a loss of oxygen or a pressure change in the cabin, there might be an oxygen mask that'll drop down for you to put on um, to help you breathe a little bit better. And part of the instruction that they give you says to secure your own mask before assisting others with theirs. And I can tell you that when we first started to fly with our kids, first with Ezra, um, instinctively that sounded really nuts to me. Um, In my mind, my protective mother spirit felt that my children's well-being far outweighed my own. So of course I was going to help them first and make sure that they were squared away. But Um, I came to realize as I thought through this a little bit more that there really is great wisdom in this because you cannot help someone else if you've not first secured your own lifeline. And in the same way, you can't expect your children to follow God first if that's not what you have first modeled. You can't expect them to have or even know what a good marriage looks like if that's not something that you're investing in and modeling for them. in in a healthy way. So as we've been looking through this hierarchy of God-given priorities in our lives um, in our My House series over the past couple weeks, we can't pencil our children into that foundational place of God, and we can't pencil them in to push out our spouses. They can't be first or second in our life because they aren't the foundation. God is a God of order, and this isn't an error in His calculations. But it is a very easy pattern to get into. Um, as, as parents, we want to prioritize our children, and that doesn't mean that they're not a priority. Um, and a lot of times they make themselves that way because they're more demanding and often express their thoughts and their feelings and their wishes um, more clearly and loudly than perhaps our spouses do. But they're ours for a season. And if we're really doing our jobs correctly, they aren't going to be with us in the same way that they are now for the long haul. And if you'll allow me to digress a little bit for just a moment, I have to get on a soapbox to say that as parents, we really need to be a united front. We're not always going to agree with each other or the the choices or opinions of our spouses. But that's good because God partnered us together to complete each other in his image, not to mirror each other in our brokenness. But in your disagreements, don't allow yourselves to be divided, especially by or in front of your children. You need to learn to fight fair and to love loudly and let them see what love and respect between the two of you looks like. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't show them how to respectfully disagree with one another. Um, You definitely need to model that so that they have an idea of how to handle conflict. Um, You don't need them to think that you're perfect, but you can't have any of this parent-to-parent nonsense. 
And by all means, do not, do not, do not use your children as a weapon against your spouse or even against your, your ex for that matter. Your children aren't the cause or the cure for your conflict with their parent. And it's your responsibility to be modeling that unconditional positive regard for them, no matter how you feel. We cannot allow our feelings to define the future for us or our children. So I'm going to hop back off of that soapbox, but that's just such an important thing as we're looking at these priorities and prioritizing God as our foundation. And then um, the second, making sure that our, our spouses are that, um, that second priority, even before our children. Um, but by first setting the example of this in our own lives, that's going to help our children to prioritize their relationship with the Lord and then we release them to Him. Our job as parents is to help our children to establish a healthy attachment to Jesus as their Savior, not to us. And as painful as that may be, especially for us as moms, you know, raising them to attach elsewhere, our priorities have got to be first in, in teaching them and foremost, teaching them to attach themselves to God and then their spouse. And that has to start with the example that we present to them. So a prodigal parent prioritizes properly. And second, they purposely prepare their children for God's call on their lives. And that's really the ultimate goal um, when it comes to parenting. Uh, prodigal parents understand that their purpose is to be a builder under God, the architect. Our job is to teach and to shape the values, character, gifts, hearts and minds of the next generation. Um, and we see this um, throughout scripture in different ways, but I love what Deuteronomy um, 6, 5 through 9 gives us and it instructs, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And these words I command to you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We have the responsibility to prioritize in our parenting this process of teaching our children. We are to teach our children a love for God through modeling and instruction. And right now, almost 100% of parents have become their children's teachers. But scripture tells us that we already should be. It is our primary job as parents to mold and shape our parents' hearts um, through our words and through our actions. And we see this in the parable of the prodigal son um, as the parents here really teach um, a powerful example, both through their words and their actions. And some of their heartbeat here is really echoed in Luke 6, 45 and Proverbs 4, 23, which tell us that we speak out of abundance or the overflow of our hearts. Our child's words and actions really reveal what's in their hearts and their minds and what's been written on them. Think about all the things that they hear and think about all day long and how that gets written on their heart. What is it that we're writing on their hearts? Is, is it something that is pleasing to the Lord? Does it reflect Him and His love for them? It's imperative that we write God's words on their heart. The world would love to confuse our children and cause them to doubt and to question who God perfectly knit them together to be. And so we need to equip them to combat the lies of the enemy that society will feed them and they can proudly then live out who God designed them to be. They can stand in that identity. And the messages that were written on the prodigal son's heart were those of restoration and hope. Um, in his darkest hour, he was able to reflect back on the grace and mercy of God that were modeled to him by his father. And so as he came to his senses, he realized he could go home. He could respond in a repentant way. And it's our job to edify our children with our words, to lift them up. And I love how the prodigal father talks to both of his sons, you know, as they're on different ends, again, of the spectrum. But in verses 
31 through 32, he says um, to the older son, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother was dead. And now he's alive. He was lost and is found. And we see here how the older son is feeling scorned and jealous over what he perceives to be injustice. He's done what his parents wanted all along and was never celebrated in a way that his brother, who's been so wayward, um, is being celebrated now. But his father, with just a few simple words, gently reminds him that he's neither lost his place in the family nor his inheritance. And he takes the opportunity on top of that to model grace and to offer correction. And in so doing, he's, he's offering and writing these messages of acceptance and inclusion of forgiveness and security on his son's heart. So I wonder, how is it that we are stewarding our children's hearts? I know for me, it's my recurring prayer that God would make me a spirit builder, not a spirit breaker. This is a particularly difficult thing to do when tensions are high and we're spread so thin, but a parent's job is not to be the perfect parent, but to follow the one who is perfect and to lead their children into a relationship with him. Um, Ephesians 5 <clears throat> really touches on this when it says, be imitators of God. Children are imitators. They mimic the things that they see and hear and are exposed to. They mimic their parents. Um, and if you don't believe that, <laughs> just listen to the things that they say or look at how they watch you as you respond to different stresses or situations in your lives. Um, I have one child who always looks at me <laughs> to read whether or not their dad is pulling their leg about something when they want a real answer. And another who studies my face as I read stories to them to better understand the emotion behind what the characters are saying. And our children are watching us. They're, they're taking our cues. And a prodigal father provides a steady model for his sons here as he gives this even keel reaction to his youngest son's rather outlandish request for his early inheritance. And then later in the way that he reflects the grace of God towards both of his sons, when the prodigal returns, he lavishes grace upon him, upon the one who's departed. And then the older son, who's been steadfast and stayed with him the whole time, um, he celebrates and encourages him but also you know, encourages him to celebrate the freedom and the transformation of his little brother rather than to respond with envy or bitterness. So being an example to our children is one of our highest callings in life. It's one of the greatest privileges and greatest responsibilities. There's that quote in Spider-Man that says, with great privilege comes great responsibility. And our responsibility is great in this, but it's important for us to remember that even in our mistakes, we can still be the right example. We can continue to point our children to Jesus, even when it means pointing to him through our own mistakes. And that's a hard and humbling thing, but there's a need for a heartbeat of repentance. And we have both the choice and the obligation to model that for our children. It's something that I've really had to pray through and learn to discipline in myself, um, disciplining myself to call out my failures and shortcomings to my children. Not in the sense necessarily of confessing every flaw or mistake that I make, but owning it when I realize that I've set the wrong example for them. It's so important for them to see me humble myself by hearing me admit when I've been wrong or could have done something differently. Um, and, and to see that it's okay to make mistakes when we come with a repentant heart and ask for forgiveness. I'm sure many of you have been in situations recently where your patience has run thin or completely run out. And we had a moment where, yes, we have moments in our house, but <laughs> we had a moment where I was just completely frustrated by something I was trying to do to, um, you know, help reorganize something and keep them happy. And I just was losing my cool. And I realized I am setting a ridiculous example for them right now. And, you know, I stopped and 
just said to them, guys, I just need you to realize that this is not about you. And I'm sorry that this is how I'm responding. And I explained the stress that I was feeling and the amount of compassion that children will have um, when you stop and say, you know what, I was wrong. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and it's something that, you know, is such a gift from the Lord when we can bring ourselves to that place. Um, and he just reminds us so much of, of his grace through our children. But we have this temptation to want to be perfect for our kids. We don't want them to see us mess up. And there's another temptation to be the ultimate source and authority um, of information and correct things in their life. But our job isn't to be perfect. It isn't to know everything, but to point them to the one who does. It's okay to admit when you don't know the answer about something and to give them those tools to accurately find the truth. Um, it's, it can create a really awesome learning and bonding opportunity to say, you know what? I don't know, but let's find out together. Um, for those of you who are, who are juggling this distance learning at the moment, um, it's okay when you don't know how to do their homework or what the answer to their question is. Don't be afraid of them thinking that you're dumb. <laughs> find an opportunity to really bond together and to learn together. It's okay and helpful to admit our own failures. Um, and it helps them to learn through our own repentance because that cultivates the same kind of values and culture within them. And part of demonstrating that discipline in our life is also in issuing discipline. And that can be a really sticky conversation, but we need to not be afraid to discipline our children and allow them to experience the natural consequences that come from their mistakes. And we see this um, with a prodigal son and the way that the father handled his son's waywardness. He recognized that for this particular son, in order for him to really come to a place of repentance and salvation, he needed to release him into the wilderness and into his wandering and, and to give him exactly what he asked for um, and not be afraid to let the bottom fall out. I think one of the toughest but most crucial things that we can be praying for our kids is that Christ would really grip their hearts at any cost. We want to protect them, but sometimes what we're doing is we're actually keeping them from experiencing a growth opportunity or a breakthrough that God has planned for them. And sometimes we just need to get out of his way. So just like the prodigal parents, uh, we also have to appreciate the uniqueness of each of our children. God designed each of them um, to be unique and they're going to have unique responses and they will need unique parenting. What works for one will not always work for the other. So choosing the kind of discipline and instruction that resonates with each child is very important because each is different. Um, and that may mean answering to your other children or changing course when you realize that what you've been doing isn't working. But but it's never too late to change course. Um, and here too, it's okay to admit your shortcomings as a parent to your child, um, particularly if you're entering into those teen years and you're starting to get pushed back about sudden changes that you're making to your parenting. It's okay to say something like, you know, I realized that what I've been doing um, in this part of our life or in this part of parenting, I haven't been doing right. And I love you. And because I love you and I believe in you and want to see you succeed in life, I need to make some changes. And they may still be resistant to that, but over the course of time, they'll also come to really respect and embrace that you admitted that and have made some changes to their benefit. So we need to love our children enough to let them fall so that they can experience the power of God lifting them to that higher place and realigning their perspective. And perspective is the final and most important piece of prodigal parenting, and that's an eternal perspective. So a, a prodigal parent prioritizes, um, they, know, they know the right priorities to hold in their life and they try to model that. They purposely prepare their children and they have an eternal perspective. I had mentioned earlier about um, the incredible lessons in parenting and generational influence that we can see as we study the Israelites' history. Um, you look at the first generation of Israelites and they stayed out of the promised land because of their faulty perspectives. They feared the giants and their own inadequacies and it had generational consequences. 
You can look at Numbers 13, 31 through 33, and it says, The men who had gone up with him said, We're not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we've gone uh, to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people we saw are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So God had brought the people of Israel right up to the gates, basically, of the promised land. And everything that they brought back was a bad report. They were concerned about their own inadequacies. They felt that the people there saw them as they saw themselves to be as small and insignificant insignificant as grasshoppers. And they missed out on enjoying the promised land for themselves and their children during that season due to their own faulty and flawed perspective um, of their own sight. They saw the size of their own limitations and their perspective eclipsed the size of God's power in their minds. And in a similar way, the oldest of the prodigal sons was limited by his own perspective of fairness, while his father had the perspective of fullness. His father saw God's promises being fulfilled the prodigal son's father had trusted God enough to release his son into his care. And then he received him back with that same kind of reckless love and mercy that God receives us back from our wandering in. Our proper perspective really comes from those times of praying from and for those unseen places. I can imagine that as the prodigal son went out, the prayers of his parents went before him and encircled him as he walked through troubling times. And his parents no doubt felt troubled in that time because they didn't know what was happening to him. They weren't FaceTiming with him across the world, but they knew his intentions. But they also knew that the prayers that they had faithfully planted and the example that they had given him would ultimately sprout up as seeds in his life and guide him back home. And there was grace in their home, there was that that space for grace that the son knew was there, but he didn't take that lightly. He wasn't flippant about it, and he returned repentant after having lost this former attitude of entitlement. And the father used his son's time away to prepare for his return, to prepare his own heart for his son's return, and continued to invest in his family. And so neat, because just like God, the father had an expectant heart and eyes. He had a vision for where the son's choices would lead him, and he knew that because of his upbringing, his choices would eventually lead him back home to that place of grace. And that's so like God, because he always devises ways to bring us back to him. And so in the same way, the prodigal son knew that he could come home. I want to encourage you, keep the door open to your children in the literal and the figurative senses. There was a story I was reading recently about a woman who always invited her son on their family walk every night. And every night he would say no. And one night they were in a hurry, so she rushed out the door and realized partway into their walk that she hadn't gone and invited her son to come. And so she told her husband, hold on, I've, I've got to go back. I need to make sure that I invite him. And he was kind of like, what's the point? You know, every, every night he says, no, he doesn't want to be here. But the point was that she wanted to make sure that even though he declined repeatedly, he always knew that he wasn't just welcome, but he was wanted. And the same was true for the prodigal son. And the same is true for us as prodigal parents. We're never too far gone in our relationship with God or as parents uh, for God to reshape our hearts and our homes if we're willing to afford ourselves the interruption, that margin to pivot to do so. Ronald Reagan had said years ago that all great change begins at the dinner table. So many parents are worried right now about checking the boxes of their children's distance learning and unfulfilled social calendars, compensating for their perceived losses however they can. But what really matters in this season is what happens at home. So let's welcome the interruption and bring things back home.